Oh, have you recovered from the sip from the fire hose, all the different types of mutual funds? And remembering that these are just the major categories. Well, guess what? It's going to get even worse now. <laughs> because now we'll finish our discussion of mutual funds by taking a look at the various fund families and then concentrating on a sample mutual fund and see what kind of returns we can get from these investment vehicles. Slide 16, a fund family. A fund family, a family of funds, exists when one mutual fund, one investment company, manages a group of mutual funds. So, it used to be, this was many years ago, that a mutual fund company had maybe one, maybe two mutual funds. And then some companies started adding more and more, and their competitors started adding more and more. And so finally, you had these huge mutual fund families with dozens, hundreds of different funds. And if one mutual fund created a domestic stock growth and income fund, large cap, whatever, then they all had to have it, right? So the funds, the funds in the family vary in their objectives. And you can move your money from one fund to another, almost always with no charge. They're not going to charge you another uh, sales charge. But if it isn't a taxable transaction, you could end up uh, generating, you will end up uh, generating a taxable transaction. If you made money, yeah, capital gains. If you lost money, well, then you have a capital loss. If it's in a retirement account, 401k, Roth IRA, then no, it, the IRS doesn't want to talk to you until you take the money out. Now, when I say almost always with no charge, there are some exceptions, and they mostly pertain to people who tend to use mutual funds as trading vehicles. They'll buy one mutual fund for a month and then sell it and buy another one. That's not what mutual funds were meant for. So what some companies will do is they'll say, all right, you want to do that? Fine, we're going to charge you 2%. In other words, they're trying to tell you not to do it. Some companies just won't let you do it, such as Vanguard and, and American funds. They just say, no, you can't do this. This is not what mutual funds are for. Others say, sure, you want to do it? We'll charge you 2%. So in other words, they're saying, don't do that, okay? <laughs> because mutual funds are long-term investments. So you're not going to – if you do it every six months, a year, okay, you're, you know, you're, you're balancing things out or whatever. But don't do it every few weeks or every month. Uh, here they are, slide 17. And again, this is data that came from the ICA.org through the investment news via a gentleman by the name of John Wagner, who's actually a very reputable uh, writer, so I tend to believe it. I have a hard time coaxing the data out of the ICA, ICI dot org website so I let it up what happened to Temple Mr. Templeton got I have to fix that Mr. Templeton got a got split in two here but um um the big the big three are Vanguard Fidelity and American and it depends on how you look at them sometimes American is put ahead of Fidelity but by far the biggest one is Vanguard Vanguard is the biggest mutual fund company out there Another, and all three of these are, are good groups. I, I'm a big fan of American myself, but, but excuse me, perdón. Um, uh, Fidelity has a, um, a very good, you know, some not so great. And Vanguard has uh, some very good funds also. But T. Rowe Price is another very good mutual fund company. It's been around for decades. In fact, you're going to look at one of the T. Rowe Price mutual funds in in the um in the uh, presentation, in the assignment, and, and you also look at one of Americans and Fidelities also. J.P. Morgan Chase got to the big top by buying a bunch of other mutual fund companies and uh, turning them into one company, and then BlackRock. BlackRock. Now, here's a real interesting company, folks. They haven't been around as long as many of the others, but they have just become the world's largest. Money manager. Now their their mutual funds, you know, are not as large as some of the other mutual fund companies, but they also uh, manage uh, private money and and uh, and the money for for countries. Uh, yeah, they're 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 a big uh, big group. And then Franklin Templeton. That's I have to fix that. The, I don't know what happened there, but the Templeton got a got separated. Franklin Templeton, another company that's been around for decades. Very good company. Has some great funds. A lot of good bond funds. 
and some great global funds. Remember Sir John Templeton? Yeah, that was his company that he eventually sold and, and retired. But uh, they also have a, com- a series called Mutual Series, uh, which is another very good company. It's in part of Franklin Templeton. Now, TIAA, I don't know if you remember back in life insurance, but they started out as a Teachers Insurance Annuity Association, only for educators. But now they've gone mainstream and they merged with Nuveen. And I don't know much about Nuveen at all. Uh, but they're, they're a good group. And then Dimensional Funds. This I, again, I'm not too familiar with them, but they're very popular with with advisors. Very popular with advisors, so I should really do a little digging into them. PIMCO uh, is the, stands for Pacific Investment Company. They're based up in Newport Beach, if you can believe that. But again, they're a global company, and they have they had <laughs> the biggest mutual fund in the world for many years, which was a bond fund. But then the the famous manager who ran it ran the fund, left. And so PIMCO all of a sudden is now, uh, what are they going to do? But there's still uh, still some very good funds. But I'm I'm a bit, as I said, you know, I'm partial to this company. But T. Rowe Price, Franklin Templeton, another company that's not, it's actually much smaller than the others, Dodge and Cox. Very good company. And and six of these companies are in Canvas on the class website. So, so check them out. Or check out the ones that are in your 401k, your 403b, or your IRA, whatever. Slide, no, okay, now, what do we do? <laughs> in the face-to-face class, we would show some some of v- Vanguard's and Fidelity's and Americans. And, and Fidelity's the real kicker because you go to their website and they have over 500 different funds, right? But then they also sell everybody else's fund. So you, you pick, click on the one click and it shows you about, you know, anywhere from 300 to 500 of their funds. And then you click on the other one and it shows you over 11,000 funds that they can sell you. They're, they're a very smart marketing organization, Fidelity. Uh, American... I like this show because they all fit on one page, and we can see the lifetime returns, and we see that the stock funds have returned you know, better than the bond funds is what you'd expect, and of course the 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 cash, the mutual, the, the money market mutual funds have returned the least. But then we show 2008, <coughs> and we see that 2008 was just horrible, with some of the funds losing 50 percent. And uh, and that was good in in 2008 if you were an aggressive growth fund. That was actually pretty darn good, a growth fund or an aggressive growth fund. And then we see the uh, uh, growth and income fund losing about 30, 35 percent. Then we see the equity income fund losing about 30, the balance fund losing about about 30, the the bond funds losing 15 and 10. And so we see that during times of extreme volatility – which is a euphemism for, oh, my God, I lost so much money. Please, Lord. <laughs> yeah, wrong, wrong thing to pray for. But, um, but um, um, yes, and, uh, and, uh, and that's something that you're going to experience. If you've invested in stocks over the long term, there's going to be times when you're going to, they're going to fall. But don't panic unless the world ends and then it doesn't matter. I'll meet you at the beach. You bring the vodka. I'll bring the marshmallows. We'll have a all good time. Slide number 18. Oh, I buy some, by the way, I forgot to add. Oops. <laughs> um, because of the mutual fund scandals of 2003, uh, there used to be about two or three companies that were kicked out of the top ten. Uh, who are they? Janus, Alliance. Who is the other one? Uh, Putnam. Yeah, Okay. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Wait a minute. Did you say mutual fund scandals? You want me to invest in an industry that is plagued with scandal? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. Um, Yeah. Since 1940, the mutual fund industry has been heavily regulated and escaped any hint of impropriety. You like that word, impropriety? It means hanky-panky. And in 2003, some practices that were not quite illegal, but obviously unethical, were uncovered. And only a handful of funds and people were affected. Strong funds, which are now gone. Janus, Bank of Armenia, a Bank of America, Putnam. Putnam is one of the oldest mutual funds, been around for decades. Alliance, a very good mutual fund company. 
and they were just destroyed because a few people, sometimes in the case of Alliance, there were two people who were doing this. Now, what were they doing? It, it, it's hard to explain, but they were stealing pennies, literally pennies, but not illegally. They weren't doing it illegally, which is why it was obviously unethical. And, and in the case of Mr. Strong, who started his own mutual fund company, it was worth $600 million at the time he did this were barred from life from ever working in the uh, industry again. So it's not as though you lost $99,999 on a $100,000 account, which is what happened for the people who owned Enron stock. And if you don't know who Enron is, look it up. They were a company that used to be very boring, an energy company, but then became very exciting by way of fraud. And the people who owned their stock lost everything. You lost, and I, I say here on this slide, a dollar on a $100,000 account. It really wasn't even a dollar. It might have been a couple of pennies. But when you have a million investors, you know, that's a lot of money. And the gentleman who started Strong Funds, he at the time was worth about $600 million, and he made about $80,000 doing this. All right. I mean, to, to you and me, that's a lot of money. But to him, it was pocket change. And afterwards, he was very contrite. He apologized to the world and said, look, this was stupid. This was I started to believe everything I read about myself, that I was invincible, that I could do anything. And this is like a Greek tragedy. You folks over in the uh, literature department could look up people who brought about their own downfall through hubris. Great word, isn't it? Hubris. The vast majority of companies never engaged in any of these shenanigans. They just didn't do it. But just a few people did. And it tarred the industry. So don't worry. It ain't going to happen again. At least this isn't. The way they did it before is not going to happen again. So slide number 19. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, especially if you were in the face-to-face the -face class and saw the hundreds, thousands of mutual funds out there. You're obviously thinking to yourself, okay, well, how do I pick a mutual fund? It ain't easy. That's the hardest part about mutual funds. Once you've chosen the mutual fund, everything else is easy. There's not much else for you to do except make sure you keep funding it. But here's some advice from yours truly. Take it for what it's worth. Pick a mutual fund that invests in high-quality stocks or bonds. You want to concentrate on quality. Now, quality, if you've ever studied it, is a very difficult thing to define. Quality is in the eyes of the beholder. It's often associated with the word love. You know, how do you define love? Good luck. <laughs> Poets and philosophers have been trying to do that for hundreds of thousands of years. But you know quality when you see it. You know, when you, when you see the companies that they invest in, you go, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a real company. They've been around for decades. They're going to be around for decades. Is well diversified across several industries and sectors of the economy. In fact, I like global mutual funds. Has a long-term perspective. And a manager, or better yet, the management team we talked about with many years of experience. You want to avoid companies that shuffle their managers every few years, which used to be virtually all of them. In fact, if you were somebody coming right out of Harvard or Stanford or, or the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Management, you would be a wunder kid, you know, your wunderkind or whatever the word is in German, a wonder child. And they would throw a billion dollars at you and say, here you go, kid, have at it. So you know, I mean, you're not stupid, right? You know that if you do well, within 18 months, two months, you get to keep your job. You get showered with love and attention and a whole lot of money. So you're not necessarily going to think in terms of the long term. You're going to shuffle or roll the dice or stack the aces or whatever. You're going to try to shoot for the fences, throw the Hail Mary pants, whatever analogy you want to use. But you're going to try to be very aggressive because you know that if you don't do well, you're going to get kicked out anyway. And if you do well, congratulations. Well, now the mutual fund companies have figured this out. They said, look, this is not the best way to invest for the long term. So more and more of them are switching to team managements where everybody works together, but they make their own decisions. And that's a good thing. 
And most importantly, you want a company that's been around for decades and performed consistently well in both good and bad markets. You see, don't tell me how well you've done in a good market because I ain't interested. I'm not. I want to know how well you did when the organic matter hit the ventilating device because it's going to happen. And that's the time, in my humble opinion, that these people earn their money when the downside hits. They want to, there's an old saying that uh, Warren Buffett likes to use. When you, when the tide goes out, you can see who's been swimming naked. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense, but think about it. Yes, in other words, there are going to be bad times and you want, you want them to, to uh, be ready for those times. Cool. Okay, so how do we deal with the times when the tide is going out? <laughs> Dear students, slide 20. Keep a long-term perspective. Is 85 years long enough for you? <laughs> Remember we said 8, 9, 10% we'd be happy with? Here is a mutual fund that's done almost 12, like 11.98 or something like that. And in the face-to-face -face class, we would now concentrate and uh, take some time to look at this one sample mutual fund. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, see it on the website or through Canvas. It's called Investment Company of America. It's been around since December 31st, 1933. Yeah, it actually predates that, but that's their, that's when they start um, doing all the uh, record keeping. And they've done 12%. And we look at a few different um, um, aspects about it. And what you'll see is that, yeah, in the short term, stocks are risky. You never know what's going to happen. It could drop 50%. It will. <laughs> Someday we know it will because it's done it in the past and, and people are not rational. They bid up the price way too high and then they knock down the price way too low. We're, we're you know, we'd like to think we're rational, but we're not. And as long as we have a long term perspective and the world doesn't end, We've done pretty darn well. And you'll hear people say, but it's not a good time to invest. Folks, it's almost never a good time to invest emotionally. The good times to invest emotionally turn out to be the worst times to invest financially. People wait until it's gone up 100, 200% and then go, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Yeah, <laughs> and then it falls 40, 30, whatever, 50%, and you hear them say, oh, is it too late to get out? <laughs> right. <laughs> so what you'll see is that if you had invested on the worst day of the last 20 years, you still did pretty well. Now, not as well as if you had invested on the best day of the year, but you're not going to do that. No one is. In fact, you are going to do what is called dollar cost averaging. One of the most boring names for a phenomenal strategy. But I've tried to come up with something better and haven't been able to do so yet. So if I ever do, I'll tell you. So that's how we deal with market downturns. We keep a long-term perspective and we dollar cost average. So please do take a look at this mutual fund it's not the i'm not trying to sell you this one I mean, there are all there are many bad ones and many not so good mutual funds but there are many many good funds and in the assignment i'm going to ask you to take a look at four pretty darn good funds and you decide which ones you'd like now dollar cost average slide 21 a system of buying an investment at regular intervals with a fixed dollar amount doesn't that sound exciting we looked at this back in chapter 11 do you remember it's just a fancy way of saying you're going to put 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month away through your checking account, through your payroll to your 401k, 403b. And the cool thing about this is that no matter what happens in the morning when you wake up, when you pick up the newspaper or go online or watch the news on television, which is very anxiety inducing, folks, by the way. Read, don't watch. Uh, there's always good news. <laughs> when I first met my wife, she was terrified of the stock market. So I'd say Anita, because that's her name, Anita. No matter what happens tomorrow, there's good news. The market's up. Good news. Yippee. Your account is worth more. Your $100 is now $100.22. <laughs> 
the market's down. Good news. Why? Huh? I don't like this. Oh, no, no, no. It's true. It's true. Why? Because you're investing for the long term. When do you want to buy stuff at Macy's or J.C. Poopies or whatever? You want to buy when there's a sale. If they raise their prices 100%, people run out the door. In the stock market, they raise their prices 100%, people run in the door. When Macy's and Target and all those other places have a sale, 50% off. People rush in the door. The stock market, people run away. <laughs> Pretty strange, huh? So just keep a long-term perspective. Keep putting 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month away. And if the world doesn't end, you should do okay. Slide 22. Hypotheticals. Most mutual fund companies have a system for running hypotheticals. It's the same kind of thing we saw back in um, in Chapter 10 when we looked at the life insurance illustration. Well, they're sometimes called illustrations in the in the um, mutual fund world. And we saw these we, when we looked at the bond funds, and then we looked at the stock fund in Chapter 12 on stocks. Well, we have some here that use in this in this chapter that use uh, a balance fund, which is a great way for people who are really frightened of the stock market, especially as you get older, a balance fund is a great idea. In fact, that's where I'm old, dear students. That's where we are putting my wife and my money now into a global balance fund. So um, here are a few that you'll take a look at, hopefully. Uh, we In the face-to-face -face class, we would stop and take a look at them, but you, you'll do that through Canvas or through the website. And they are examples of returns from a lump sum principle or that stream of investment. That's, you know, that's probably the best term, I, the dollar cost averaging, a stream of investments. Because I think like to think of it as a river, and of course as rivers get closer to the ocean, they get bigger and larger and wider. But you have to be licensed to, to do these things, in which case I am, so I can show it to you. Um, they must be approved and contain disclaimers about past versus future performance. It's very legal easy, and it doesn't make any sense to most people, and, and it's very good for insomnia. If you have insomnia, you just start reading this, and you will fall fast asleep. But check it out, because, again, the news is good. The last 20 years, the last 100 years, have been the most prosperous years in the history of the world, and I firmly believe that the future is going to be better. If we don't blow ourselves up, die in our own waste, meteorite, tsunami, earthquake, Ebola, disco returns, you, you just never know what's going to happen. That's why we call it the future. But I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that we understand that we're all in this together. And this system has to work for everyone. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. You guys, you, you young folks, you're going to have to deal with a lot of the problems that we old folks have created, but we fix some of the old problems that the older, older folks created. So, so it goes, as Mr. Vonnegut said a long time ago, Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, <coughs> and the cool news. Now, I, you, I, I show, we showed you the Investment Company of America, but on slide 23, the cool news is that it's not the only one. There are many good mutual funds out there and some that have been around for well over 50 years. Do you remember this slide from Chapter 1 when we tried to get you interested? And we've lost so many students now. It's sad. But we tried to show you right at the beginning that, yeah, there, there's good information out there. There's good, there are good um, investments to be had. Look at this guy. 1967, 11.3. 1950, 11.47. Dodge and Cox since 1965. They're a real wild company. I like them. They're real they're very unusual. Check them out. They only have five funds. They've been around since 1931, but they're just they they, they, don't, they definitely buck the trend. And then Fidelity. There's the Fidelity Contra Fund, a very good fund. Franklin Templeton, an excellent company. There's the Investment Company of America, 1934. MFS, the nation's large, lo oldest. I'm sorry, they're the nation's oldest mutual fund company. Uh, Massachusetts Financial Services, I think it stands for. It's based in Boston. And then T. Rowe Price, based in Baltimore. Very good company. Check them out. 
Dreyfus has been around for a long time. There's Templeton, which is part of Franklin Templeton. Then the couple of Vanguard funds, and then Washington Mutual Investors Fund. But look, where's that T. Rowe Price Fund? Look at that. 12.75%, almost 13%, over 50 some odd years. Over 60 years. Was it 56, 60, 62, 33 years? Yeah, 53 years. Pretty darn good. So you see, now, am I trying to sell you these mutual funds? Well, actually, no, especially if you're younger and just starting out. Why? Because most all of these funds are domestic, meaning that they're based mostly in the United States. And, and the reason that most all of them are United States funds is because there's just not that many global funds that have been around over 50 years. It wasn't until the 1970s, 1980s that the United Staters woke up to the to the realization that there's a lot of, of economic activity going on outside the United States. It was the, um, the, the conventional wisdom that you just simply stayed in the United States because that's, it was less risky than outside the United States. And as measured by um, our measurements of risk, which are n not perfect, it was true. You know, if you invested outside the United States, it was far riskier. But they started that me we we started waking up to the uh, to the fact that there's a lot of stuff going on outside the United States. So right now, if you went to me, came to me and said, you know, um, I'm looking to invest. I'm young. I want to start 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month. I would show you a global mutual fund because, in my humble opinion, the world is global, and you have to think globally now. You have to. Give your money manager the flexibility to invest anywhere around the world. And that's just when you're starting off. I mean, later on, you can specialize. If you want to specialize in one area of the world or one sector of the economy, go right ahead. Good luck. <laughs> in my humble opinion, you'll need it because you know, concentration is a dual-edged sword. It can you know, really help your returns and help you uh, achieve wealth quickly. Or it can really, yeah, be turn out not so good. That's why we love mutual funds that have broad diversification. In fact, that was one of the two reasons we buy mutual funds, right? Diversification and uh, professional money management. Cool. Aren't you happy now that you took this class? I hope so. Slide 24. The bottom line on mutual funds. Choose a fund family. Stick with them especially if they've been around for decades and have done well in good times and bad times. Because the truth is, most mutual fund investors do worse than the mutual funds they invest in. Now, this is a saying that's been around the industry for a long time, but it's been proven empirically via statistics. Huh? How can mutual fund investors do worse than the mutual funds they invest in? It's actually very easy. Right, they wait until the market goes up 100%, and then they buy, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? And then the market falls 20, 30, 40% or more, and they, oh, is it too late to get out? And then they pull their money out at the worst possible time. So stick with your mutual fund, assuming you've done a good job researching, or maybe you have a financial advisor recommending. Reevaluate them periodically but make changes judiciously and sparingly. You like those words? I like those words. As you approach retirement, migrate from stock funds to bond funds, but don't give up on stocks entirely. We're going to discuss, obviously, coming up in retirement. And even in retirement, you still need some growth. Okay? And we'll see that in when we get to our chapter. We'll see a bond uh, portfolio versus a stock and bond or balance portfolio. And use dollar cost averaging. 50 bucks a month, $100 a month, whatever you can afford. Don't kill the present. <laughs> but still, you need to do something. How much is your cell phone payment, dear students? Right. For the most part, forget about them. You know, it kind of makes investing boring, but it works. And in the investment world, boring is good. Trust me, <laughs> all the excitement I've ever done, except for a couple, have not turned out as well as I thought it was going to turn out. 
boring has always turned out pretty darn good. Okay, dear students, we are finished with our financial investing uh, coverage because in our next chapter, which is not in the book, they took it out of the book, we're going to take a look at alternative investments and spend a great deal of time on real estate, which is a tremendous uh, investment, but also a royal pain in the... <laughs> Remember the PETA factor, which is very, very low in mutual funds? It's off the charts when you deal with real estate, but very, very uh, profitable or deadly. And then we'll take a look at some of alternatives that for the most of us, for most, most of us po folks just don't make any sense. We are so very proud of you have, for making it this far, dear students, and we want you to keep going, study every day, bring honor and glory to Southwestern College, to your family and friends, because now you are the rising investment guru, and it's a very serious responsibility. You must take it seriously because your friends and family and coworkers are depending on you. See you in our next chapter on real estate and other investment alternatives.